We can, we can start with Matt, who just has a few thoughts to share with us. So if you're ready, Matt, come out to the front and uh, far away. <coughs> Um, well, my original thoughts was to do something about the Cornish accent, because I'm from Cornwall, and it's uh, something that's uh, a lot of interest to me. Something else that is interest to me is the Cornish language, and uh, you know, I just would like to do something uh, around that. And uh, my immediate thought was to see if there was any sort of way that the Cornish accent reflects upon the Cornish language. And I thought, perhaps that's going to be a bit difficult. Um, to, to find everything, but then uh, after last week's lecture about Scots and uh, the Scottish Gaelic, the pre-aspiration of tea, I thought well, perhaps there is something similar along those lines that I could uh, I could find a comment on. Um, I had, I've been up there's a Celtic section in the library, and I've been up and had a few had a look at a few books in there. The uh, they're not particularly good phonology-wise. So. <laughs> There was one thing I remember, I think it's discussing the quality of, of the vowel of ah or something. It says that in Cornish it's the same as English but not as posh. <laughs> Which I don't think is a very sort of scientific way. But um, there was some stuff that m may be of interest or not. One thing that I've been thinking about most is um, in Cornish apparently yes becomes z uh, between vowels or syllable finally. Um, and I'll sort of rack my brains to if I can think of any sort of uh, examples of people speaking when perhaps that might come up, which I can't. The only thing I can think of is uh, place names, although that would, I would assume they'd be uh, lexicalised. Um, that initial, <coughs> isn't it? Sorry? That initial, rather than medial or final. I mean, things like Zenner. Uh, well, well, the place, place names I was thinking of was um, place is spelled B I S S O E. Right. And I always used to call it Bisso. And right. most I assume most people choose to call it Bisso as well, right. but a lot of people actually call it Bisso. Okay. Um, and also with syllable finally, there's uh, Sonostal. Uh, a lot of people call it Sonos. Well, they Sonos. see Sonos, they take the T away as well. I don't know if that's something different, mm -hmm. obviously is. But that goes right down to Sonos in the right. basis. So, um, <coughs> you know, this, these are all just thoughts. I've got nothing sort of set in stone. But so, uh, right, that place now, I think it's perhaps not everybody. Very nice day for a play. Snobble. Snobble. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've, I've been thinking about it and um, ways to go about it. I don't know whether it would be uh, best to think about the Cornish accent and then try and find some Cornish language features that map onto it or the other way around and look at the language and find parallels from the... I think you're quite right. The problem is knowing about the phonetics of Cornish because Cornish is a language that's been revived really rather than having continued being spoken over the years. It's had about 200 years of death, shall we say, before its revival in recent years. And... Um, the result in my suspicion is that people speak Cornish using the sounds of their English, which is what you'd expect, rather than the other way around. But if, I mean, and the other thing is that, unlike, say, Devon, Cornish is very sort of standard. It's not all that deviant in many ways, as far as I can understand. And that, again, would reflect the displacement of Cornish while people spoke Cornish, that was one thing, but when they gave up Cornish to speak English, they learned the standard more or less, just like people in Inverness speak pretty standard English, standard Scottish English, and they don't have the Scots that you get in places further south where Scots has persisted all the way through. I'm just curious, I don't know if either of you know any Cornish, but I have no idea what it Oh, it's very like Welsh, um, except that it's spelling uses English spelling conventions, but there is a lot of disagreement, if I remember rightly, about the standard form of Cornish, isn't that right? Uh, well, uh, like you said, it has been, I think it's, uh, they call it Neo-Cornish, that any Cornish that is spoken today they call Neo-Cornish, and it's apparently nothing like the real Cornish that was spoken uh, uh, all those years ago. Yes. The, the last speaker of Cornish was supposed to be one Dolly Pentreath. Yeah. When did she die? Um, <laughs> 18... Early 1800s, I think. Early 1800s, so it is a 200-year gap. Uh, but, I mean, 
knowing Welsh, if I look at something in Cornish, if I say it aloud, I can usually work out what it means, because Welsh and Cornish were a single language up until the Battle of Gloucester in about 1200 or something like that, which split the Celtic speakers in Wales from the Celtic speakers in the southwest, whose language became Cornish and who finally disappeared and all speak English now, whereas Welsh remained in Wales. Yes? But that's, that's just thoughts. I mean, there are other, other things that I may, I may do instead. Um, for instance, looking at the, similar, the, again, the similarities between Cornish and uh, like the Welsh in Pembrokeshire and places right, yes. like that. The Welsh in Pembrokeshire, well, the English in Pembrokeshire is very interesting because Southern oh, Pembrokeshire was, English always, English was always English, you know, it's never been Welsh speaking. Northern Pembrokeshire is Welsh speaking, but Southern Pembrokeshire is English speaking. Uh, well, there, are, there is some, a lot of data about Cornish in the Leeds Survey of English Dialects because they did a whole lot of collecting there in the 1950s, and that's in the library, you can see that. How representative it is of anything that happens today, I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, in all the Southwest, there was supposed to be this voicing of initial fricatives, so that it, instead of Somerset, you have Zomerzet, Z, and uh, instead of six, you have Zix, and so on. You came across this in Gloucester, did you a bit or not? No, no, in Somerset. In no. Somerset, right. But yeah. it's a bit of a jokey thing now, isn't it? Yes. I, I've never heard it in real life, but, I mean, historically, this is why we have Fox but Vixen, because Vixen is a... A southern form of the yeah. feminine, and so it's got initial voicing of the, of the, of the v. Um, I have heard Vic used though. Oh, right. Well, Vic made. Good. Vic meaning thick. No, no. No? This. Oh, Vic meaning this. Mm. Oh, even more exotic. Exotic, <laughs> yes. Okay, well, again, that would be a very historical form, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, thanks very much. If anybody's got any comments to make to Matt, please do so. <laughs> I, I mean, we can easily say, okay, that now Cornish people sound much the same as anybody else, but the question is, what is that? Because it's not RP, what is it? And uh, so we can describe what it is. Yeah. It isn't easy to find Cornish people in Cornwall, in my experience, unless you're you know, a fisherman well, or something, because it's got such a huge it's full of incomers, yes. From like, elsewhere. Like a lot of rural places, I mean, the since... You know, about 50 years ago, agriculture has essentially collapsed mm. in the countryside. It used to require enormous workforce. And so there were lots of people busy, you know, getting the harvest in or whatever needed to be there. But now, uh, what used to be done by 50 people is done by one man or two men. And um, so, yes. And the result is that people from the towns have bought up all the nice cottages and they have them as uh, holiday homes or to go to at the weekend. And it, means a very great change in the demography of, of the countryside. That's certainly true. Nevertheless, Matt himself grew up in Cornwall, so he's a Cornishman, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. There, is, there are a lot of people that, that seem <coughs> to me to speak Cornish. Right. But uh, whether or not it's probably changed since the 1950s. Yes. Yeah. What part of Cornwall are you actually from? I'm from Farmer. Oh, I was oh. actually born in Cornwall. Okay. I've lived there most of my life. Right. Because, I mean, there are these urban places, they're not very big, but towns, uh, you know, Redruth and Camborne and uh, Falmouth and St. Austell and Penzance, I suppose, and they're all big enough to have an established local population who are not incomers from elsewhere but live there and uh, go to school. And schools are the way that we propagate particular local varieties, really, by people imitating one another. Do you know any Cornish, then, if you studied it a bit? Um, I really want to... Start to learn it, but well, I, I, I do know people who have taught themselves uh, themselves Cornish, and uh, I say it is very similar to Welsh. You're right. Yes. Yeah. So perhaps we need to just explain to everybody that the Celtic languages in the British Isles fall into two main groups known as P-Celtic and Q-Celtic on the basis of what happens to Indo-European Q, which in P-Celtic becomes P. And we have this, for example, in the word, the number five, Latin quinque, which in Welsh is pimp. And it's presumably something similar in Cornish. Put there. And the word for head is another one which 
in Welsh's pen comes in uh, lots of place names. But in Q Celtic, which means Scottish Gaelic and Irish, you get a vila from this. So the Irish for five is coic, and the word for head is kyan, and so on. So you get vila or paradise vila from these same sources. And that's this big division, the Welsh Breton Cornish, Breton in France, Welsh Breton Cornish, which is one branch of Celtic, and Scottish Gaelic, Irish Gaelic, Manx, which is the other branch. Yeah, well, okay. <coughs> what else can we say about Cornish? Not a lot. So thank you, Matt. Uh, I couldn't get any other volunteers. Anybody change their mind? Would like to say anything? If not, you're going to get uh, Caribbean from me today. <coughs> Which, I'm sorry, because I had to take the intonation class, I haven't been able to make a PowerPoint presentation, but I've got to hand out it anyway. <coughs> Okay. Well, most of us know something about West Indian English because we have a lot of West Indians or people of West Indian heritage living in England and in London. But the Caribbean, the West Indies itself, is actually a very varied place. It consists mainly of islands, and each of these islands is different from the others. And historically, they were fought over by the various imperial powers, Spain, England, France, the Netherlands, sometimes some others as well. And uh, they sort of changed hands and went back and forth. And this is all, in a sense, reflected in their present linguistic nature, which means that, on the whole, they speak the language of the former imperial power, whatever it was. So in the big islands of Cuba, Puerto Rico, people speak Spanish. And uh, those are millions and millions of people. Y you can see the island that is shown as Haiti and Dominican Republic. Well, that's an island divided into two halves. And the Dominican Republic half of it speaks Spanish. And Haiti speaks what other language? French. French. On the other hand, most people in Haiti don't speak standard French as is spoken in Paris. And most of them are actually illiterate in standard French. What they speak is a special kind of local French, which linguists call French Creole, and which is known locally by a variety of names. And these Creole languages are found in many of the islands or mainland territories of the West Indies. This is due to, and they were put together in holding prisons or whatever along the coast of what is now Ghana and was then the Gold Coast or other parts of the coast of West Africa and all mixed together. And from there they were then taken across the Atlantic to Brazil, to the West Indies, to North America. And since they were all mixed up together, of course, they couldn't, on the whole, continue to use their home languages, their African languages. But they had to be able to communicate, they had to do something. And so these various Creole languages arose, what exactly that means is not clear, but arose, uh, which means that they were languages spoken by people without formal education, in an emergency situation, trying to make themselves understood or to understand. And so the languages that resulted, the Creole languages, are very strikingly simplified in terms of their grammar compared with the base languages, the European languages from which their lexicon is taken. And with a gross simplification, we can say that Quite a lot of the grammar, the syntax, is that of African languages, but again, very much simplified. Although the lexical material is almost entirely European, from the appropriate European language. Nevertheless, a lot of mixing, and there are words of African origin uh, in these Creole languages, and indeed they may have given some of them to the standard languages.
what we find in Jamaica, for example, among the ordinary uneducated populace, is this variety now known as Jamaican Creole, popularly called Patois, or Broken English, or Jamaica Talk, various other names for it, which is clearly English in one sense, the words are from English on the whole, but on the other hand it's not really mutually intelligible with standard English. I had to learn it consciously in order to understand it. Maybe it's a bit easier nowadays with so many more West Indians in London that people are sort of more exposed to it and more aware of it, but certainly when I was young I wasn't. Nevertheless, it's something that I spent a great deal of effort over because this was the topic of my PhD thesis, which then appeared in book form as a book called Jamaican Pronunciation in London. I was interested in accent change, really. What do people do when they want to change their accent for some reason? And the Jamaicans recently then arrived in London and were a very good group to study because they spoke English, but with a very different kind of pronunciation, quite apart from the differences of grammar and so on. And yet they were put in a situation having to function in London where they had to get by, and obviously they had to accommodate themselves to the new circumstances. And so that's what I looked at to see what they did. And I found more or less a confirmation of the predictions that they found it very difficult to acquire new phonemic distinctions, but quite easy to acquire new phonetic realizations of units they already had. So, for example, the Jamaican for face is pronounced like this, fierce. If you say, this is my face, in Jamaican Creole, it would sound like this, afimifias. A is fi for me face, is for, my, is for me face, afimifias. So you can see the grammar is very different. But that then gets sort of counted onto English in the form <coughs> of, is my face, is my face. And that would be the English conversion of that Creole grammar. But I'm interested in the pronunciation, you see, and we've got this fierce. Now, people coming to London were confronted with posh English people saying face, and unposh people, who were the ones they mainly mixed with in many cases, saying face. So both of those are quite away from fierce. Posh Jamaicans, by the way, say face, with a monophone, face. So we've got three, well, four really different things we can consider. Posh Jamaican fierce, non-posh Jamaican fierce, Posh English face and non posh English face, or something wider than that. And in a nutshell, what I found was that the people who came from a middle class Jamaican background, which included a lot of people who came as uh, nurses, for example, they just didn't change anything. Or they might just change the quality, but on the whole, they didn't change it much. But those who came from a Jamaican working class background, peasants from the country or from the slums of Kingston, they had to do a change because nobody could understand them if they went on saying fierce. And they usually went the whole way to face. So they went from one extreme, if you like, to the other. And it did show also that the people at the bottom of the heap were the ones who were linguistically insecure and much more ready to change things. The people who had some kind of educational or class background in Jamaica felt more secure in their language and so didn't make so many changes. And that's also part of the prediction. However, the trouble is that, as I say, although you can change the realization of a phoneme, it's very difficult to acquire a new phonemic contrast. One of the One of the things that you get in broad Jamaican, so working class Jamaican English, is no dental fricatives. And words that we have with a dental fricative have a plosive instead, th stop. And this means that a pair like tick and thick are complete homophones in popular Jamaican, Jamaican Creole. The clack pandiwal a tick, it's ticking, and uh, what should we have that's thick? The book tick, or whatever. Both of them are tick, absolutely identical. 
I once, in fact, was in a conversation with somebody discussing debt. And I thought it was about higher purchase and uh, the importance of not getting, you know, overstretched with credit cards and things. But uh, after a bit I discovered, no, he was talking about something much more <laughs> mortal. And so it was death and death, that you could easily misunderstand it. The context may, of course, make it clear, but it doesn't always, as that little anecdote shows. And that's uh, a true life experience, because, of course, I spent a long time mixing with Jamaicans, recently arrived in London in order to do all my field work. <coughs> well, now, supposing you're a Jamaican who says tick, and you discover that it's elegant to say thick instead, or if you're very observant, you may see that Londoners often say thick, and that's another matter with an F. What's this you've got here? Well, you know it is in Tom, Jamaican, McDonald, I think it's Tom. And we compare that with ting, a well-known word, almost a sort of uh, shibboleth for Jamaicans who say and ting, meaning and so on. But of course, the elegant version of ting is thing, the dental fricative. So what a lot of my informants offered me when I asked them naming the parts of the body, they said thumb. Do you see the mechanism? Thumb. This is hypercorrection. It seems to be a good strategy to change t to th at the beginning of a word because it gives you an elegant pronunciation of thing. But it's difficult to know which words to do it in and which words not to do it in, particularly if you're not good at reading and writing, which many of them weren't. If you're literate, of course, then you can just think of the spelling. And if it's th, say th, if it's t, say t. You'll still get caught out, won't you, with one or two words? Like St. Thomas's Hospital oh, yeah. <laughs> and the River Thames. Mm. Yeah, there are one or two traps, but generally speaking, if you're literate, you can think of the spelling. But if you're not literate, and it's important to try and put yourself in the position of someone who isn't, then you don't know which words it's appropriate to change to th and which not. So I got quite a lot of this. Hypercorrection. Another interesting thing I got, which is part of the phonology neither of London nor of Jamaica, but only of the mixing between the two, lots of people had picked up the London habit of glottally for final T. So they said instead of saying right, Jamaican style, they could say right with a glottal stop. Very nice and uh, Londony. But then think of a word like both. Jamaican, boot, with a T at the end, boot. Both of them, boot of them. What I got from some of my informants is boot of them, boot of them, with a glottal stop. But Londoners don't glottal the TH sounds. You can only get this from this intersection of Jamaican and London. So it's a very interesting things to discover. That was a time. Uh, 30 odd years ago when there was a lot of interest in Jamaican English for the very first time. This is the <coughs> Dictionary of Jamaican Creole, which has two authors, one Fred Cassidy, the other uh, Bob LePage. And um, Bob LePage was my external examiner for the PhD because he was the pioneer who, taking up a job in the University of the West Indies in Kingston, said, why aren't we studying this language that's all around us, because up to then nobody had really looked into Jamaican Creole. And so uh, he, he did this, this dictionary and he collected a great deal of information and he organized conferences and so on uh, to popularize the idea that this is something to study, something to look at, rather than something to be ashamed of, which is what people have tended to assume previously. And likewise, it was seen as very strange that I, an outsider, a white stranger, should be wanting to ask people about how they spoke, and what was I doing this for? And this got a lot of suspicion. So when I went to Jamaica to do my field work to get the starting point well established in my own mind, so I could see what they came from, I found that the best people, you know, I wanted to learn Jamaican Creole, you can't learn it from book, or you couldn't in those days. The best people I found were children of about 11 or 12, because they were big enough to know their language very thoroughly, but young enough not to be embarrassed by it. 
and also they had the patience to say things over and over again and to go on explaining things to this stupid person who kept asking them about things. And uh, so that's how I did my best to teach myself Jamaican Creole. Well, if you have a look at the <coughs> map again, you will see that uh, it does mark all these various territories with a, a letter and a number which tell you what the Creole is in that particular language and in that particular place. And generally speaking, all of the English-based Creoles are similar to one another, although they're different. I mean, they're not the same. Everybody can tell a Jamaican, everybody who is from Trinidad or Antigua or Barbados can tell that immediately. And if you're at all familiar with West Indians, you too can recognize a Bajan immediately opens his mouth. That's somebody from Barbados. I must say, people are very, uh, West Indians are often very surprised when English people can do this. I gave a lecture last term to outside body somewhere, and there was a, a black man who stood up at the end and asked a question, and of course I could immediately hear, hear that he was Barbadian, so I replied, referring to this, he was terribly impressed, and you know, my prestige went up that I could recognise a Bajan. But once you know how, it's very easy, and the way to recognise Bajans is that their speech is fully rhotic, and they are the only West Indians who have all the R's present. So if somebody says farmer, and they're West Indian, then they're Bajan. Uh, you can see that, as well as Jamaica, that's the largest uh, of the English-speaking islands, there are a whole lot of islands in the leewards and windwards. Can you see the leewards and the windwards? Where it says Atlantic Ocean, below that, in that sort of column. All these little islands, Anguilla, Antigua, Montserrat, are English-speaking, but they're interspersed with islands that speak other languages. So Guadeloupe, Politically, it's part of France, and they certainly speak French, or French Creole. Then we have Dominica, which was won by the English from the French in about 1800, by which time its population was already established, speaking French Creole, but it became a British colony. So English is the official language, and Dominicans to this day speak a French Creole at home, but have English as their official language. Uh, <coughs> and I think English is gradually displacing, English Creole is gradually dis displacing French Creole. I, I stayed in <coughs> Dominica in a hotel overlooking a taxi rank and I was listening with interest to the speech, the talk of the taxi drivers and they on the whole spoke English rather than French, which is very interesting. Of course they had to for their job because they were dealing with visiting tourists, but even so between themselves they also spoke English, which as far as I understand is not usually the case among Dominicans in the, in the countryside on their own. Further south, you can see Martinique, another part of France, French. Then St. Lucia, like Dominica, but with French Creole perhaps receding even faster. But if you talk to St. Lucians in London, you'll find that most of them can speak French Creole. We had a student here some many years ago who wrote a PhD thesis about his language, which was St. Lucian Creole. Barbados is English speaking, Grenada, St. Vincent are English speaking, Tobago and Trinidad are English speaking. <coughs> there are also the territories on the mainland, Guyana, Suriname, and French Guinea, which speak well, they're respectively politically. English colony was Guyana, formerly British, Guyana, British Guiana, Suriname was Dutch and French Guiana was and is French. Suriname is particularly interesting because although the official language was Dutch, a lot of people there spoke English Creoles. And this is actually very important because if we compare Jamaica with Suriname, in Jamaica, although everybody speaks this Jamaican Creole at home, or most people do, the official language is standard English. And so the school teaches standard English. The newspaper is written in standard English. The television, the radio is in standard English. Uh, business is conducted in standard English. Every kind of official purpose, public purpose, uses standard English. And so for three, 300 years, they've been gradually pulled back towards standard English. And the, the Creole is something perhaps to be ashamed of because it's something associated with ignorance and poverty and lack of getting on in but in Suriname, it has no such status. 
in Suriname, what you have to do to get on in the world is speak Dutch. And particularly in the interior of Suriname, there are groups of people who are descended from escaped slaves who 200, 300 years ago escaped into this vast interior in South America, jungle, miles from anybody, and have been living their own lives ever since. And they speak languages that are English Creoles, but which have absolutely gone their own way without any influence from standard English. And they are very different. They certainly are not at all mutually intelligible with our kind of English. Whereas Jamaicans, you know, you can get by. Jamaicans are certainly used to dealing with speakers of standard English, because all of them more so nowadays. That's why Jamaican is often called a post-Creole, or a Creoloid, or a semi-Creole, various terms you'll come across. If you want to <coughs> follow this up, again, if I can refer to another <coughs> graduate of the department, got his PhD with us, John Holm, Pigeons and Creoles, Volume 1, Volume 2, collecting all the information he could about all the pigeons and creoles in the world, and very interesting it is. And this map is taken from his book. And you see, uh, I told some of you that at Christmas I went to these bay islands, which you can see off the coast of Honduras, Roatan, where I found people speaking English as their first language, and clearly the whole island operates in English as its language, even though politically it's part of Honduras, which is, which is Spanish-speaking. But if I'd bothered to look at Holmes's book more carefully before I'd gone, I'd have seen here it is, Bay Islands, it says E5, E5, Bay Islands, English, with a star against it to say that it's a, uh, a semi-creole. So it's all, all that information is there. <coughs> okay, let's have a look at the phonetic characteristics then. Consonants. TH stopping, we've talked about that. It means that faith and fate both sound the same, fiat. It means that breed and breathe both sound the same. Breed. Breed. Yes, in and out. It means that your parents are your mother and your father. Notice they preserve the vowel length difference. That's very much alive there. Mada has a short vowel. It may sometimes be ma rather than mo in Jamaican, so mada rather than the expected moda. But father certainly has a, excuse me, a long vowel in contrast with it. OK, TH stopping, this, that, all that stuff. Cluster reduction. Now, we know this is a, a childish thing on the whole in English English. This means that any word that we have that has a an elidable consonant at the end. Find the clusters like ST and ND. You know, we, we taught you the rule that in English, the T or the D, or we, I guess, can be elided before a following consonant. Well, in Creoles, it gets elided anyhow. It gets lost, and it, the word is lexicalized without it. So the word for friend is fren. The word for old is ul. The word for stand is stan, or actually also tan. Oh, it's that position as well. Well, that's a different one, but yes, it does, yes. Uh, loss of initial T is very rough. I had to spend quite a long time in Jamaica before I heard anybody saying tan up drit. Tan up drit. Stand up straight. And another nice utterance I remember was me kinna cratch me, which means I'm itching, my skin is scratching me. Me kin a cratch me. Ah, gives you progressive aspects in grammar. I'm not teaching the grammar, but ah corresponds to ing on the end. So a cratch means scratching, is, is scratching. <coughs> Cluster reduction then. This means that, yes, a pair of words like guess and guest are homophones, both of them guess. And again, I found in my London survey that this was a rich source of hypercorrections. I devised some kind of a questionnaire item which was along the lines, if someone tells you something but you're not quite sure what he said and you just try something to see if it's right, then you would be, I wanted to get the word guessing. And quite a few people gave me guesting. Okay, was that hypercorrect to you in guesting? Guesting. 
This also gives rise to big problems in correct use of the ed ending in written English. Because if slice and sliced are going to be pronounced the same, and also they don't have a past tense marker in the grammar, the two things reinforce one another and people get utterly uncertain whether or not it's appropriate to say and also whether it's appropriate to write this ED. And this seems to carry over into people born and brought up in London, in England, who you'd think know English English, but they still have problems with writing ED correctly on words in, in, in British schools. Somehow they're not sure about that, which reflects Jamaican grammar and uh, pronunciation phonetics. Okay, next item we've got here is H-dropping. Now, this is where we have to distinguish between different kinds of West Indian English. All the other islands pronounce their H's in the standard way, and they laugh at Jamaicans who speak bad because the Jamaicans don't pronounce the H's. So everybody knows that Jamaicans, uh, you know, say an, where everybody else says han, the hand. And, as you would predict, Jamaicans hypercorrect, and so you also get Easter egg for Easter egg, with the H put in back, just to be sure. Now, that was the prevailing view when I set off to do my field work. But in Jamaica, I spent part of the time in Kingston, the capital, okay, fine, that's what people did there, but the other part of the time in the depths of the country at the western end of the island, in a small village there. And I observed that people in this small village all pronounce the H's in the standard words, in the standard places. So on the basis of this, in fact, I was able in my book finally to produce a, a map of Jamaica showing where H is preserved and where it's lost on the basis of their performance in my survey in London. Can't find it now, but it's somewhere in the book. And basically speaking, it's people in the eastern end of the island, including the capital Kingston, who drop H's, and people in the western end of the island retain them. So that was an interesting thing I discovered. And again, there are one or two words that are different. People are not doing it by reference to the spelling. They have, they have the word to owe something, meaning to admit it. I owe you our rights, sir. That kind of archaic literary usage in English. But in the village that I was working in, they call that hua. Me hua say you right. I admit you are right. So that's the way they have stored this particular word. But it's not a hypercorrect H like Easter egg. It's just the way that word is spelt in their local form of it. <coughs> Undifferentiated L, that's no surprise. Clear and dark L are a southern English invention. Roticity. Well, as I say, this varies geographically. Barbados is rhotic. Jamaican is semi-rhotic, by which I mean it loses R before a consonant, but retains it finally, at least after a strong vowel. So they're a bit variable even with this, but basically speaking, Jamaicans say farmer for farmer, but they say star for star. Okay, they retain that final R after a strong vowel. And this is very noticeable, or it was when I was doing my field work in Kingston, because the name of the local evening paper is the Star, and there were lots of newsboys running around waving it and calling out Star, 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 with this final er, and you could hear that very clearly. And of course, correspondingly, in, in London, it would have been called Star, 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 with no er. But I also got the impression that er is seen as an elegant variant for them. I got people to tell me the story of Cinderella, and I've got that on tape, where she, most of the time she, it was a matter of a, a, a golden slippers, or glass slippers, plural used with singular reference, but on one occasion the person said slippers, slippers, as if that's a more elegant variant of it. Yeah, grammatically, as well as not marking tense, generally speaking, you don't mark number in Creole, so the same form acts for the singular and plural, just as in Japanese or Chinese. Well, 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 you don't really need plural endings. But one or two words have been <coughs> taken in their, what is their, English plural form, and that's the one that's used for that singular and plural. A good example is the word for shoe, which is shoes, and you would buy a shoes rather than a shoe, <coughs> or a pair of shoes. Uh, 
And uh, really, this is just like nose or cheese. It's a word that happens to end in z. Flowers is another one. And therefore, the thing you put the flowers in is called a flowers pot. And the person at a wedding who has to hold them is called a flowers gal, a flower girl. So that is the basic form of it. And one flower is a... Ah, flowers. Oh, one flowers. Again, this is a thing that educated people avoid, of course, but yes, in popular speech, that's what it is. I made a list of these words at one stage. Okay, Jamaica semi-rhotic. The <coughs> leewards, windwards, places like Antigua, places like uh, Grenada, are non-rotic. So no R's there. So they actually are just like us. They use linking R and intrusive R just the same as we do. One big giveaway for West Indian speech is this special allophone of W. If we take the word wheel, four wheels on a car, no wh, of course, no H there, but wheel. Now, clear L, wheel, but they don't use the same W because it sounds like this, wheel, 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 wheel. Can you hear wheel? And that's because the whole thing is palatalized. U is a labiopalatal semivowel rather than a labiovelar semivowel. It's like an U vowel of French, but not so bad. Real, real. So here's its phonetic symbols you see there. Res for West, West Indies. Sweep for sweep and so on. Sweep, 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 sweep. This seems to have clear African origins. Exactly the same rule applies in uh, a number of Ghanaian languages, the important tree group of languages, uh, <coughs> which. You see, in fact, in the name of the language itself, chi, which has before the e, chi, 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 not chui, twi. <coughs> Some more special things that are sort of like vowel glides. The word cat in Jamaican is not on the whole cat, as you would predict, but kiat. Kiat, kiat, kiat. And the word garden is very often garden, garden, with this palatal glide in there. Now, this you find in Irish English. Very strikingly a characteristic of Irish English, and it may be that the Irish have some input in this, or it may just be that it's old fashioned and it was around 300, 400 years ago at the time that Western English was being formed. Very important to remember that English in the West Indies has a long history. Ignorant English people sometimes saw with these black faces coming, they think they must be foreigners, what language do you speak at home? And they were always surprised when people said English. But yes, they speak English, and they have done, they know no other language. They think of it as English, we may call it now Jamaican Creole or whatever, depending on the locality, but it is essentially a variety of English. And they consider themselves speakers of English, and if they go to Cuba or somewhere, they know they have to learn a foreign language, and it's Spanish, and, uh, you know. But if they go to somewhere else is English speaking, they expect to speak their own language in English. So, Kjat and Gjarden are have got a good pedigree. Jamaicans also have something funny with P and B before OI. Namely, they insert a W glide. So rather than boy, people say why. OI and I fall together anyhow, so you'd expect by, but they don't say by, they say why. Come here, boy. Come here, boy. Why, why, why? And if something gets spoilt, it poil. Loses the S, poil. L is clear, W inserted. Of course, once I've worked out all of these various rules, it's a lot easier to see what was going on and to understand people and to produce the right forms myself. Well, that's about consonants. Vowels. We've mentioned vowel length already. A sort of tendency towards strong vowels, not so many schwas, not much vowel reduction. You see this in <coughs> the article V, which in English English and American English is most commonly pronounced the, so the table, the boy. But in West Indian English it's usually de, de table, de boy. <coughs> de, de, de. We use the only before vowels, but it's the normal form in West Indian English. 
West Indian English D everywhere. <coughs> you get strong endings in words like government, meant, rather than meant. Careless, less rather than less or less. And when people use the past tense ending after T and D, it's ed, weighted, rather than weighted, as we usually do. But in Creole, you don't have it. OK, we've also mentioned the quality of the face vowel. In Jamaican, e or ear. You get the same thing reflected on the other side of the vowel area. The vowel of the goat set is elegant Jamaican, o, goat, I don't know. Less elegant Jamaican, o, goat, <coughs> mina, no, I don't know. <coughs> That, again, is something that varies from place to place. You do get that kind of thing in the Leewards, but <coughs> as you go further south, you get monophons. And in Guyana or in Trinidad, it's just a monophon, or a, like that. <coughs> Everywhere in the West Indies, the lexical sets near and square are merged. OK, the difference that we make in English-English between ear and air fear and fair and so on is lost, but both of them are the same. What they result on, it depends on the island, but there's no difference between them. So in Jamaica, fear and fair are both fear. In Barbados, they're both fear, but in Antigua, they're both fear. And in Trinidad, they're both fear. <coughs> no contrast. Uh, I picked up, when I was in Barbados, an advertising slogan. They have a, a beer there called Banks's Beer, and the slogan read, bear in mind, Banks is beer. OK, bear in mind, keep it in your head, bear in mind, Banks is beer. But it depends upon the punning, the identity of sound of bear and beer, which <coughs> wouldn't work as a slogan for us <coughs> in England. <coughs> uh, there's also a merger of cure and force, which doesn't surprise the English, because we've done the same thing very generally. On the other hand, they, <laughs> we'll come to that in a minute, it's a force and north. Possible mergers of trap and lot. In Jamaican English, in popular Jamaican, trap and lot have the same vowel, trap, lot. Which means that black is ambiguous. Because you can have a blacker ice, block, or black and white, black. And they're both pronounced the same as black. Rat. Rat the animal, or rot if something putrefies. Rot. Rot. Leads to a lot of confusion for educated people with pairs of words like adapt and adopt that have very nearly the same meaning anyhow, and since they're pronounced the same, <coughs> adapt in West Indian English, tricky to get them sorted out. Start and north have the same vowel. In fact, in Jamaican Creole, start and north rhyme, don't they? Dad, nad. Not and salt. Price and choice rhyme, price choice. Notice that they don't merge the lexical sets force and north, which we all do. So north is an open vowel, not, but sport is the close vowel, sport. Short is open, shart. Short sport becomes shat sport. If you eat pork and you use a fork to do so, you get it the right way around, it's pork and you eat it with one fork. The number 44 is 44. They're different, reflected in our spelling, but we've forgotten why, because once upon a time there was a vowel difference, but it's there alive and well in Jamaican English. And really, for my learning to pronounce Jamaican English, let alone the grammar or the vocabulary, but for the pronunciation, this is the thing that I found most difficult, because this is where I had to make a lexical split. And I could put <coughs> it on the basis of the spelling reliably. And so I just had to remember that the porch in front of my house is a porch and not a parch, because you wouldn't know otherwise. <coughs> Yes, the mouth vowel, we've seen in London how this tends towards the ow 
front starting point, mouth, mouth and whatnot. In Jamaica, it's just the other way around. It goes back, moat. Mo, mo, o, even moat, moat. It can sound really very, very back. So this is one that people have to make a big decision about when they are black growing up in London. What are they going to do? Are they going to be little Londoners and say math, or are they going to be little West Indians and say moat? And with the consonant at the end as well, very different. In the South, uh, Caribbean, so in uh, Barbados or Trinidad or Guyana, you have an interesting thing that whenever you get ow followed by n, the n becomes velar and the diphthong simplifies. So rather than down, they say dung, and it's the same as dung, d u n g. Downtown is dung tongue. Check this on a <coughs> what they call a maxi taxi in Trinidad, which is what you or I might call a minibus picking up passengers. And uh, where where you go, where you're going, dung tongue, the same dung tongue image. And indeed, this seems to persist into educated speech. We had a, a Guyanese who was on the staff here some years ago, and what was his subject? Accountancy, accountancy, not accountancy, but accountancy. Further north, you get this in one or two common words, like down, but not throughout the whole vocabulary as you do in the Southern Caribbean. Well, Didn't we you say something about the uh, vowel? I was going yes. to say that it seems to be realised as well, this. It depends where we're talking about. Jamaican, <coughs> within a word, it can be this <coughs> ah, so that bird and bud, uh, burgeoning, are identical of bud. Some words, though, are special. Girl is one of them, and it has the gyal form, or gyal, but that's for historical reasons. Um, <laughs> it's the first thing to get roticity back. Bird, if it's going to have it. In um, Montserrat, that I know well, in the leewards, they say bod, bod, and it's sort of long, but rounded. And I don't think it's the same as any other of the vowels around. Does that answer the question? I don't know. Yes, I've just, I'm okay. sure I've heard words like nurse. Yes, nurse. Well, I don't know about nurse. Jamaican, rough Jamaican would be nos. Oh, yes. yes Posh Jamaican is nurse or nurse. Nurse. Yes. Nurse, yes. Okay, we've run out of time. Thank you for your attention. And lots of you are going to contribute next week, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs>